If you're holding dollars, the whole world is on sale right now. And as Asia has reopened, you can set up your residence in tax-friendly Asia at a deep discount to a year ago's prices. I'm gonna share with you three Asian destinations that are on sale today. <music> The discounts on Asian currencies aren't quite as much as those on European currencies, primarily the Euro, but if you like the idea of living in tax-friendly Southeast or East Asia, I'm going to share with you some options. Let's talk about what we're not going to talk about today. The Philippines is not on the list. Their residence programs uh, have primarily been denominated in dollars. You're not saving anything there. Singapore, even folks we've worked with with hundreds of millions of dollars have found the conditions to be a little bit frustrating. So unless you want to start a business and pay taxes, or unless you want to get a high paying job in Singapore, not only has the currency not really gotten beaten up much against the dollar, uh, but it's going to be a place that not many people are going to want to go to because there's no passport, you've got to live there. Uh, and so that's not as good. Uh, Taiwan, concerning the most folks we talk to, so that's generally off the list. And if you're a Commonwealth citizen, as I am through, let's say, a Caribbean citizenship by investment, the cost of Pakistani citizenship, the Pakistani rupee, which is available to Commonwealth citizens, probably also not of interest to most people. But that said, let's get into the three countries where you might want to go in Asia, where you can lower your taxes, increase your lifestyle, have better weather. I'm Andrew Henderson, founder of Nomad Capitalist. We help seven and eight figure entrepreneurs and investors legally reduce your taxes, protect your assets, increase your freedom, and grow your opportunities. Let's start in Malaysia, my home. So the currency, the Malaysian ringgit, down about 12% against the US dollar in the last year. That is a more than a decade low for the Malaysian ringgit. We've really never seen levels like this before. So 4.73 to the dollar as I sit here. What can you do with that? Well, the digital nomad visa they're rolling out, if you just wanna live in Malaysia you know, for a while, is based on $2,000 income. So you're not really gonna see much benefit there. Where you will see a benefit is the NM2H. Uh, if you want to live in mainland Malaysia and you don't want to bother with the Sarawak MM2H, which allows people who are a little bit older to, to invest less, you can come to mainland peninsular Malaysia and invest 1 million ringgit into a bank. So it's basically a bank deposit. And so if you look at that, you're getting pretty close down to about 200,000 US dollars. So that is an all time low. They did raise that number from 300,000 up to a million when they redid the program. Uh, but you're gonna get in for uh, the lowest number on that 1 million ringgit that you would have. Interest rates are nominal as they are in many other places of the world, uh, but you are seeing some increases there. You also need to get that uh, residence permit, which is valid for 10 years to uh, have 40,000 ringgit per month income. So when they change this, People who were on pensions, for example, were frustrated that, uh, oh, they're no longer eligible. So that income now is down to about 84, 8,500 US dollars a month. So it's still not tiny. It's about 100,000 US dollars a year, a little more that you need to qualify for this. So this is more for you've got a business or you've just got like a really souped up pension or an annuity or something that's churning out a lot of cash flow every month. Proving the cash flow is not that difficult, generally looking for a few bank statements. So it's not really that difficult but you have to have the money with the currency down that allows you to qualify. What's interesting is Malaysia actually has, in my opinion, some of the best deals on real estate in Southeast Asia, not as an investment, but simply as a lifestyle. And so compared to Bangkok, where prices are through the roof these days, I mean, five, $6,000 per square meter and more, you can buy stuff in Malaysia for $1,500 a meter. I mean, that's less than what I've paid for property in Bogota, Colombia. It's less than what you'll pay in Tbilisi, Georgia these days. And so that's a price based on buying a larger property. So you can still be paying a decent amount of money. But the cool thing about Malaysia is if you're coming, let's say from the United States, you're used to larger spaces. You're not gonna be jammed into a shoebox the way you would be in some other Asian countries. You can still buy places that are maybe a little bit older, 10, 15 years. Uh, but you can buy some really large spaces at very low prices per square meter. And so because most Asian countries use their own local currency rather than the US dollar or the euro that you find in, let's say, Latin America or Europe to transact property prices, you get the benefit on buying the property that you wouldn't in all other parts of the world of actually that property price going down in addition to your residence permit being less. Malaysia is also rolling out its new VIP program. So those numbers are going to go down. That's a 20 year visa. The only difference really for people who don't wanna be in Malaysia, they wanna keep an option, is that the MM2H is gonna require 90 days per year, whereas the VAP doesn't really require any time. But there's a substantial fee in that. So for me, Malaysia, not really a back pocket option anymore, but a great option if you wanna spend time in somewhere. And if you wanna live somewhere full time, it's still relatively tax friendly, despite some of the news that you may have seen uh, about Malaysia. So bring it down 12%. Also down 12% next door, Thailand, the Thai bot. 
again, I mean, we haven't seen levels of 38 to the dollar in a long, long time. And so that's down from 33 and change a year ago. What can this get you? Well, again, the benefit of Asia versus Latin America is they're pricing most of the requirements that they want to see in their own local currency. So unlike Latin America, for example, where they say we need a $2,000 pension to get in, Thailand, let's say the retirement visa, it's going to be a little bit cheaper to get in. If you're an investor, the price of the uh, Thailand investor visa, bank deposit, bond deposit, or real estate from a developer, barely $260,000. Thai elite visa, uh, those prices have gone down 12% as well. And so if I'm looking for a place to park money in a bank, Thailand's banks, and I would say Malaysia's banks too, I would say are relatively strong banks. And so if I want diversification, I'm not going to earn huge interest rates in these. I mean, the interest rates you know, on, on Thai bot are 1% at best right now, which is, which is quite frustrating given what you can earn in other Asian banks on U.S. dollars. So interest rates in Malaysia and Thailand are not, not good. Thailand is even worse. But if I'm just concerned about giving myself a lifestyle option, I can get an investor visa in Thailand. I've got to be there basically one day a year. And so now I've got a back pocket option. I'm not going to ever get Thai citizenship under that. But I'm going to have a country where I can go and live in a very tax-friendly way if I ever wanted to. I can go live there now or I can keep it in my back pocket and just spend that one day per year. And I can invest about $40,000 less than I would have a year ago to turn that on. Right? And so I'm just going to hold those Thai bots sitting there. For people like the Chinese, the Thai bot is kind of a secondary safe haven. I mean, you look at there's gold vaults, for example, in Bangkok. And so Singapore has always been, in my opinion, the gold standard. Hong Kong, for some folks, you could, you could say there's pros and cons to storing stuff in Hong Kong. As a financial center, certainly it's been much usurped by, uh, by Singapore these days. Very clear winner is Singapore. But as a secondary safe haven, I mean, Bangkok uh, stores gold, not only for Thais, but for foreigners uh, from Asia generally. Um, the Thai bot has been seen as kind of a secondary safe haven currency by some folks in Asia. And so right now it's at a discount. The Thai bot, unlike some of these currencies, has gone kind of in waves of the years, up and down. And so if you think there's a potential, maybe there's an arbitrage opportunity. If not, you're just paying uh, for the opportunity to have that access to live in Thailand. I think the more tax-friendly countries with great weather you can have access to, especially one like, one like Thailand, where they're more strict on tourist visas and you can't just live there full-time on a tourist visa, that's not a bad thing to have, especially if you wanted to put money somewhere anyway. Uh, the biggest drop in Asia that could be of interest is one we've talked about occasionally, but I think people don't talk about enough, and that's South Korea. Now, if you live in South Korea full-time, you're going to pay taxes. They do have some deals that I'm aware of uh, for foreigners, but you're going to pay moderate levels of taxation. The good news is that, I mean, not every country has a tax treaty with Thailand or Malaysia. South Korea is a bit more flexible in that regard in that you have some tax treaties. But the South Korean won is down 18%. It's about $1,427 the dollar. Again, we're reaching somewhat unprecedented territory. And so you're looking at you know, less than $350,000 for real estate in select parts of the country to be able to get a residence permit. And you should probably be there a couple weeks a year. There's a bit of you know, ambiguity in that. But you can basically have, you can get towards permanent residence. You can, you can get towards citizenship if you want, if you really want to take I think it's 1,000 plus hours of Korean classes over the years, and you have to become really good at it. And in most cases, you've got to give up your other citizenships. So it's not ideal for most people to get citizenship, but to be able to have or to get to permanent residence in one of the more developed East Asian countries. You know, certainly Singapore is very developed. And I think certainly Malaysia and Thailand both punch above their weight in terms of consumer conveniences. I mean, they really offer more than you'd expect. Drive around Malaysia. Uh, and you'll see excellent roads, excellent infrastructure. People don't necessarily realize that. But if you want to be in some of the little bit more you know, temperate climate, if you want to be in somewhere that's even more developed, it's the, the, this great industrial you know, powerhouse in Asia, having access to South Korea is not a bad idea. And if you just spend a couple of weeks there, you're not going to necessarily be in the tax net. And so uh, having a residence in South Korea, not a bad deal. It is now about 50 plus thousand dollars less than it was a year ago. And so certainly you could argue there is uh, growth potential in Korea. They've done an amazing job growing their economy in your lifetime. So those are three cheap Asian residences that you can get by turning your dollars into cheaper Asian currencies. 
You're not doing citizenship plays in Asia. That's Latin America. That's Europe. If that's what you want. But there's something to be said about having citizenship elsewhere and living in a country where you are the foreigner. You almost have some benefits of being the foreigner in some of these countries. You almost get treated better in some ways. They're like, ah, the foreigner. I let him, I leave him alone. And so living in a place on a residence permit that's tax friendly, that is friendly to you and, and, and leaves you alone and having the citizenship somewhere else, that's a good strategy.